question today that is on bleeding and coagulation disorders which i'm sure you would have done some of it through your physiology and pathology and pediatrics and maybe surgery but let us try to put it all together and uh, then we'll see uh, let me start the slides okay so when i start the slides i have to do the sharing sharing show my you'll have to tell me whether you can see the screen or not can you see the screen this chance okay do you see the screen or i am not sharing it well hello can you see the screen pariniti can you see the slides hello will somebody tell me yes in the line yes thank you thank you i can now be confident that we can start i will do a um, full presentation on this and if i go here there will not do i have to keep seeing the questions um, okay so let us say you know bleeding and coagulation disorders they don't seem to be leaving you any time soon the bleeding and coagulation disorders have been there for time immemorial and you the final years of malanazar medical college must have been more conversant with it because we have created a hemophilia center here a pure bleeding coagulation disorder and the coagulation and bleeding disorders also are important because wherever you go the bleeding and coagulation is important you go to these uh, these uh, obstetrics you go to the village posting the deaths that occur after maternal mortality that we speak of the single most important cause is bleeding the surgery that you see there are issues of bleeding cardiovascular disorders they put them on anticoagulants bleeding neurology bleeding all over you will see bleeding and sadly the management or the approach to bleeding disorders is still lacking it is not so good and there is a reason why it is so it is so because uh, the tests that are required for uh, bleeding are not as simple as the biochemistry test so you have these tests where you put the blood in the sequential multiple analyzer sma and out comes a sugar report urea report hemoglobin report and they are all pretty good but the coagulation tests are very finicky because when you are drawing the blood when you are drawing the blood in case there is a formation of microthrombus during the drawing of the blood for testing that can consume the clotting factor so these are very finicky kind of uh, tests and are not uh, liked by the technicians or the doctors who are doing it and that is why the infrastructure is low when the infrastructure is low the diagnosis is low when the diagnosis is low the intervention and the treatments also are low so when we think of the bleeding disorders we think of bleeding let's say somebody has uh, a needle or a knife injury such a knife injury the first injury that comes in is vascular the vessel is cut so the blood starts coming and that's taken as very serious especially if it is a arterial vessel but if it is capillary or venous blood with simple pressure it tends to settle down out comes the blood and the first mechanism to stop the bleeding would be platelets which are very sticky now these sticky platelets would try to come together adhere together and form what is called a platelet clot the third one is on the left side that is the formation of not platelet clot but a good clot like what you see the coagula the the milk that uh, curdles you know when you make paneer out of it now that kind of a clot that comes and it is similar process where the proteins of the blood 
they start coagulating and lead to the formation of fibrin and this fibrin becomes strengthened and so strong now there is a problem with this process if this process of stopping the blood because if you don't stop the blood bleeding then the blood, the person can die to can bleed to death so it is important that nature creates a mechanism where bleeding is not uh, not allowed to bleed to death but at the same time the clotting mechanism whether it is a vascular spasm the first one or the platelet plug or the clotting protein fibrin if they start and the process goes on and on and on it will lead to two problems there will be excess coagulation human body thrives on balanced coagulation so that there is no ischemic heart disease ischemic stroke from excess thrombosis and no bleeding so whatever clots have formed will need to be recanalized because they have blocked the vessel also and they'll have to be stopped also from acting going overboard and that is where the fourth process of fibrinolysis comes in which is given at the right lower right lower uh, part of the slide so when you look at the vascular injury there is exposed uh, endothelium and that generates you know these are all linked this endothelium will generate the clotting fibrin process so you can see that it will eventually contribute to the thrombin then the adhesion aggregation of the platelet and platelet plug formation the first three things that you see are important which will concern and then the thrombin comes in from the right side and there is a fibrin formation and there is a consolidation and fibrin stabilization and finally the thrombolysis when you look at when you look at the endothelial cell the endothelium exists everywhere wherever there is a bleeding but this intact endothelium is very important for the clotting mechanism okay so let's look at some of these disorders the vascular disorders and the platelet disorders and the clotting protein disorders now vascular disorders you would remember from the history of medicine this vitamin c deficiency on these persons who used to go for months into the sea and would not have so much to eat and they'll get deficient in vitamin c and develop uh, scurvy and the bleeding and from gums that is of course a thing of the past you don't see it any longer but in elderly you have these vessels which become uh, fragile and they get into senile purpura in young medical disorders you have the cushing's disease where the vessels again are fragile their vessel wall is weak Inoxonlin purpura is a disease of the young where after some maybe viral insert a couple of weeks later they develop these uh, particular rashes over the lower limbs just full of it and they just come out of the blue when you have forgotten about the fever also and that is a vascular purpura it is called the inoxonlin purpura quite common um, in the young children and can go and be associated with IgA nephropathy where there is simple hematuria so you have this purpura and hematuria combination coming into your exams also sometimes in optional in purpura the waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia a kind of multiple myeloma where the myeloma is not igg but it is igm large protein chunks that can also affect these vessels and a related disorder would be amyloid amyloidosis AA protein amyloidosis also affects these uh, these uh, vessels, and the cryoglobulinemia would always get deposited and uh, damage the function of these endothelium. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is a connective tissue disorder. You have seen these uh, small boys and girls on the roadside where they twist their bodies left, right, and center and go in circles. Some of them would be Ehlers-Danlos syndrome also, but they have these vessel disorders. Rendu Osler Weber syndrome, where you see these telangiectasia. Some of you, all of you are in ninth semester. So if you have attended my OPD or our clinic, sometimes you would see this lady who keeps coming with telangiectasia. She actually was referred to us for anemia because when you have a vascular defect, small vascular defects, which are hereditary, which means they go on with you for lifelong. Now those are the ones there. They will keep bleeding. 
And once they keep bleeding, chronic bleed will give rise to iron deficiency anemia. So they would come to us with the iron deficiency anemia, but when you look into their conjunctiva, you might find these still injectees as you look into their tongue or palate or body, you will see these still injectees or if you look into the to the ultrasound also or CT those you might find them in the liver and lungs also from lungs they can bleed also so the vascular disorders are common and out of them vitamin c we don't see so commonly but senile purpura cushing's disease inoxaline purpura and these immunoglobulin disorders are common ehlers Dehlers syndrome is younger but you can come across but their bleed is not such a problem hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia yeah, come in and it can be a spot diagnosis for anyone. Then we come to the platelet surface proteins. I think we can leave it because there are many proteins. But what is important is these glycoproteins, GP, 1A, 2A, 2B, 3A, 1B, 9. Now this set of uh, proteins on the surface of uh, platelets, they are receptors. And these receptors will bring in a coordinated uh, effort for the formation of a clot. So there are these collagen receptors, which are 1A, 2A, or fibrinogen receptor, which is 2B, 3A, or phonolibrin factor receptor. So all of them will come in because phonolibrin factor is tied to factor 8. So it brings in there. So you will see that all of them are together and they give rise to this. The corollary also is if in a hereditary disorder, you have a defect in 1A, 2A, or 2B, 3A, or 1B, 9, that will produce problem of coagulation. That means they'll start bleeding. And that bleeding would be similar to the bleeding that we see in vascular disorders. That means they are superficial bleeds. They don't, they are superficial bleeds and they are fatigue, at most they are ecchymosis, they are not the large bleeds into the muscles and the joints and big clot formation. So these are the kind of things that you will see in platelet and vascular disorders, what we call as the superficial bleed. So this is uh, showing a pictorial diagram of uh, how the region, so there is a platelet 1B and you can see fundamental factor tied to factor 8. They, it brings it together. And there are hundreds of these platelets which will come in there uh, to this uh, receptor and they'll just put in a plug. So platelet plug would get uh, stuck there. And then there is platelet aggregation, which is 2B, 3A and fibrinogen comes in. And then I think you have seen it. So this is unstimulated ADP and the thrombin. We don't have time for this. So let us go further. Oh, okay. So these are probably you have seen the graphs in the pathology. So the disorders of platelets, there are two things here. Uh, the disorders of platelets can be quantitative, which means when you do a complete blood count, CBC, the platelet count, which is normally between 150,000 to 400,000 would have come down. Or they can be qualitative. That means the count is normal, but the function is not there. Now this becomes very important because there are few areas in medicine where this concept of quantitative and qualitative comes in, but it is at the real peak in cases of platelets. So you can have uh, low platelets quantitatively or qualitative defects like Lenzmann's, you do a platelet count, it is normal. Werner's earlier, it is normal. But when you do the platelet function and platelet function means I said about the addition, aggregation, and whatever they release. So the simple way that one looks at the function on bedside is you do a you do a finger prick, uh, you know, finger finger. Uh, you stick a needle into the finger, and you take the drop of blood and make a smear. So fresh blood smear. So the fresh blood smear would always show you platelets that are pretty here together. So if you see these clumps of platelets, you know that their function is okay. The same thing of quantitative and qualitative defects can come into the acquired disorders also. 
And the most common acquired disorder that you will see is ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, and rightly it is called AITP, autoimmune idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. And then there are uh, this thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura that you see in the elderly after some infective illness, viral, and then they settle, settle down. The common cause for thrombocytopenia these days also is chemotherapy, drug chemotherapy, which kills the cancers. Cancers are the cells which are very fast dividing. When it kills these cancer cells because they are fast dividing, rapid turnover, then the rapid turnover cells of bone marrow also are knocked out and you get pancytopenia, including low platelets, or you can sometimes get only low platelets. So AITP from a disease and from a drug, chemotherapy is very important. There are other drugs that can give rise to this. And the third group of disorders that you should remember in adults is leukemia, aplastic anemia, myelodysplasia, SLE, HIV, malaria, dengue that you are seeing these days, or DIC. So there are these acquired medical disorders of uh, leukemia, aplastic anemia, MDS, and then the infective disorders with or without DIC that give rise to a thrombocytopenia, low platelets causing bleeding, superficial bleeding. Qualitative defects are very important, overlooked, because when you do the blood counts, then you find that the counts are normal and one tends to forget. A simple example is a large number of population is on low dose aspirin for diabetes, blood pressure, ischemic heart disease, thrombosis, vascular disorders, so many. It's very, very common. They tend to forget because they've been taking it for years. They go in for a dental extraction or a big surgery. Sometimes they can bleed. And this low-dose aspirin does cause a side effect of bleeding from the gut and produces anemia, but overtly it's not very common. The problem with these NSAIDs is when they knock the platelet, they plate, knock the platelet, the function of the platelet for its lifetime. So platelets have got a lifespan of about one week to 10 days. So once somebody takes aspirin, that platelet's function is locked out, knocked out for that whole time. And uh, that means you'll have to stop it for a week or before the function comes back. There are some of these penicillin antibiotics also that can cause it. Uremia affects the platelet functions. Uremia causes a condition like pseudoconvolutin disease. Liver disease causes defect of coagulation proteins that we will hear, but they can also cause a disorder of the uh, function of the platelets. Myelomas and leukemias, CMS, macroglobulinemias, myelomas can also cause these problems. Acquired type of convalidant disease is what you see in myeloma also. Now let us uh, look at this. This is what, you know, if you see this, I don't know whether this, uh, this, uh, I'll have to use the other one. I will not be able to use my mouse, is that right? Pointer, okay, pointer. So if it is, you're seeing this on the left uh, picture, these blue dots that you're seeing, they're all clumped. This is the clumping of the platelets, which indicates that their function is good. They would be there if you're not using any anticoagulant when you're drawing the blood film. But you know, there are times when what happens, you take the blood in EDTA, you make a smear from there, these platelets should be separate, but you see these clumps. And this is called uh, pseudothrombocytopenia from the clumping. And this can give rise to falsely low platelet count. So patient has no bleeding disorder, but the platelet count is low. When you look at the smear, you'll see these clumps, which should not be there, and that, that means the low platelet count is fictitious and you should do a manual count. This is satellites, so the platelets uh, come around it, that also decreases the count. This is uh, Mayhaglin and normally the platelets, which are so small, they're the smallest cells, see this, 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 and this becomes big cell, large um, platelets, and that is what causes a problem. 
So big platelet defects are many. Giant platelets are found in and also acquired disorders. In fact, the commonest cause for giant platelets would be high in deficiency anemia. Then there are myeloid dysplastic syndromes, myeloproliferative syndromes. Wherever there is a turnover, then it will come. And these are the large platelets that you can see in wherever there is a big turnover or these con hereditary defects of May, Higlin, Bernard, Sulier, or Gray platelet syndrome. Okay, let's talk a little more about the AITP because these are the cases you'll be seeing in the ward in the clinics. So, in as the name says, autoimmune, thrombocytopenic purpura, there are these platelet antibodies. There are five types, and these go and bind to the to the to the platelets, and these platelets are engulfed by the clearing mechanism, including the macrophages, and the number of platelets come down, comes 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 down. Clinically, often you will, they would have a history of a preceding antecedent viral illness, mostly in children, but sometimes they forget about it. And the first attack they forget, and they forget the viral illness also. And they come. This is acute. Acute is seen mostly in children, and they have a very good prognosis. They would have a self-limiting disease of small petechiae or a low platelet count, and it tends to settle down within few weeks, and they require no therapy and they just need a follow-up because sometimes these acute when they settle down in future they can relapse in children the chances of relapsing are very small in adults the chance of relapse is not uncommon so that will become a chronic itp which is more common in adults and it causes moderate to severe thrombocytopenia sometimes you get a thrombocytopenia of four or four thousand or ten thousand and these give rise to a perpetual mucosal type of bleeding. So they would have petechiae, they would have ecchymosis, they will have gum bleeding. Women would have menorrhagia, and uh, they can have GI bleed because that is also mucosal bleed. And the diagnosis is difficult. Remember, AITP carries I, which is idiopathic. That means you need to exclude others, only then you will come to it. idiopathic. So the difference between many other diseases and AITP is the other diseases that give rise to thrombocytopenia, like malaria, would have a splenomegaly. That is, uh, uh, that's part of the disease process of malaria. SLE, if it causes uh, ITP, would have a splenomegaly. Leukemia, if it causes ITP, may have a splenomegaly. Now those that helps you, but that still does not tell you that it is idiopathic all the while and there are no other infiltrative disorders so what is done is you look at the patient's history and clinical examination then do a bone marrow if it is idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura which is autoimmune that means the platelets are being cleared off because of the antigen antibody reaction when they get cleared off when they get cleared off uh, from the blood bone marrow makes more of them so you will see a bone marrow which will have a lot of thrombo, thro, thrombopoietic response. In fact, some will be large because, as I said, turnover is more than they can become large. So if you see a, the parent cells of thrombocyte is called mycocaryocyte when it is big. So in AITP, you will see what is called megakaryocytic thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia because of the, what you see in the blood megakaryocytes because of what you see in the bone marrow. So the hallmark would be megakaryocytic thrombocytopenia, and second thing will be, there will be nothing to suggest a infiltrative disorder. So the diagnosis, once it is made, it is there for the lifetime. And once the diagnosis is made, um, based on the laboratory test in the bone marrow, MK is megakaryocytes. And the platelet antibodies you can do, but very often they are not done in clinical practice. The treatment is immunosuppressive because of the autoimmune nature, autoimmune or immune nature of the disease. Corticosteroids, prednisolone, one milligram per kg until the response, and you and then you bring it down. Because in adults it is chronic, you don't want to give corticosteroids for a long time because of their side effects. So sometimes for the initial attack. You give high dose high BIG, intravenous immunoglobulin, which is called normal human immunoglobulin, 
in a dose of 0.4 gram per kg per day into five days, that becomes two gram. And that can treat the, the first episode. And once the first episode is treated, the second episode may come after a very long time or may not even come after a long time. NTD does the same way. And if the steroids have been given for a long time or IVIG has been given and they don't respond or they stop responding later and they have significant thrombocytopenia with significant bleed, then splenectomy is something that you can do after at least three to six months. In acute phase, we don't generally do splenectomy. Once you do the splenectomy, the protective benefit of uh, spleen will go away. So before you do this splenectomy, one of the problem is encapsulated bacteria like pneumococcus get the body has a safety mechanism. You know, body deals with the encapsulated bacteria through the spleen. So it's a separate mechanism. You have heard of uh, native immunity and uh, you know the innate immunity and the acquired immunity, but spleen also has immune function where the, limo, the the encapsulated bacteria are taken care of. So once spleen is out, they have a higher risk of causing problem and high risk of proliferation once they cause infection. So these persons must receive pneumococcal vaccine 15 days before, two weeks before any surgery elective. But if it is urgent, then you can't do anything. So the pneumococcal vaccine once given is effective for five years. So this is given standard um, treatment for ITP splenectomy and before that you give it. If they are relapsed then there are newer drugs that are coming in, rituximab is another monoclonal antibody and romiplostin. Like erythropoietin we have for anemia for generating the erythropoiesis, romiplostin is uh, something that generates a thrombopoietin agent. So that can also be given, okay? I will not spend time here today. Now, these were the vascular and um, platelet disorders, which cause superficial mucosal bleed. Then this real strength of a clot, if it is a big bleed, major bleed, comes from the coagulation system where there are a dozen clotting proteins which work in conjunction and give rise to a very strong fabric of a fabric clot, and it gets strengthened also further. This is called a clot. This is a fibrin clot. And these are required where, or rather these prevent what is called the deeper bleeds. So you have bleed into the joints, into the muscles, into the brain, into the viscera or inside thorax. Now those are the large bleeds, huge bleeds. They can even cause uh, anemia by themselves because so much blood accumulates there. And you, as I was saying, the classical example that you can think of is hemophilia because we have a hemophilia center here. And these clotting uh, mechanisms are important in understanding the uh, clot formation. And hence, you will see that the topic for today is bleeding disorders and clotting or coagulation disorders. So we have done the bleeding disorders, now we're into coagulation disorders. You will see all this cascade that you'll see a very confusing kind of a cascade. I can also show you where there are enzymes, calcium, platelet, phospholipid. But what you should keep in mind is there are this set of proteins called clotting factor proteins. They are like enzymes. They work on a surface and that is the phospholipid surface provided by the platelets. They need calcium, or by and large, all of them will need calcium. And they'll need, uh, generate a new protein, which will generate a new reaction. Like the bleeding, you cannot have the um, uh, clotting process going on endless, and you will have some anticoagulant proteins to stop the process when there is no need for it. So in uh, bleeding, we spoke of vascular and platelets. And in clotting, we speak of intrinsic and extrinsic. So extrinsic is like, if you take the same scalpel uh, analogy, so if there is a scalpel that injures the finger, then 
the moment that vessel is exposed to the air it initiates a clotting process also coagulation protein activation now that is called extrinsic and what will happen inside would be intrinsic because of the need so you see it is so confusing i mean like these all these diagrams you can see but the easy way to remember this is this chart which you can um, take it as one of your take home message the ultimate aim of clotting process is to give the formation of fibrin the left lower that you see right lower that you see both sides is same so the lower most panel is the ultimate aim and this fibrin will be formed when fibrinogen which is a precursor protein will convert into fibrin and this conversion comes from thrombin so the clotting process basically is a thrombin generation process because once thrombin is generated that will bring the fibrin from the fibrin now thrombin comes from prothrombin which is factor 2 in the center that you see f2 so prothrombin has to change into thrombin now this one seems to be very clear and simple that the we call clot a thrombus so if we call clot a thrombus thrombin formation is important so there are two steps one is a step beyond thrombin formation that is that thrombin will change fibrinogen into fibrin the clot fibrin clot and one step is before thrombin and that is generation of something which leads to the formation of thrombin and that is called this step is called 10a formation 10a means activated factor 10a formation so activated 10a formation occurs and requires activated factor 9 which requires activated factor 8 so i think you forget the rest of the clotting process just remember that for the uh, thrombin clot you have thrombin one step below one step up above and most of your practical uh, uh, requirements will be met with this chart starting with thrombin 10a and as i said there are all these when they interact you know like when thrombin is coming on fibrinogen or factor activated factor 10 is generating thrombin from factor 2 which is prothrombin they need a substrate which is the phospholipid from the from the platelets they need the a substrate which is prothrombin here they need the enzyme and sometimes they need the coenzyme or the factor and they need the calcium so there are four five five things that they always need so this is what i was mentioning to you extrinsic pathway is tissue factor so once the tissue there is an injury there is a tissue factor it is called tf it is a factor and that generates and uh, goes on with the factor seven and you will see the big arrow on the right side that extrinsic pathway comes into x on factor 10 do you see this 10 it will bring 10 a now along with 10 it can act on 5 that's a different issue but you will see that 10 will bring and make the 10 a and the downward arrow will change factor 2 prothrombin to thrombin thrombin will change fibrin into fibrin the corresponding part in the intrinsic pathway there are many proteins that you will see and 8 and 9 are here and 8 or 9 are crucial for acting on 10. So 8, 9, 10 on the intrinsic side, tissue factor because it comes from the extrinsic tissue on the extrinsic, you know, on the this side will give to clot formation. Let's leave this. Let's leave this. Uh, so once there is a clot, it gets stabilized, then we don't want it to block the whole vessel and that vessel becomes redundant. That way, a person over a period of his lifetime will have many of the blood vessels getting blocked and that will not be a good idea. So, it is important that that, uh, that, uh, that uh, vessel is cleared by the process, what is called fibrinolysis, okay? So, fibrinolysis is a process where this fibrin, remember the fibrin clock? it is lysed important very very important fibrinolysis is very important because it will clear the pathway and the blood will start flowing again after repairing the 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 injured vessel area 
This fibrinolysis is by another protein called plasminogen, which has to be activated into plasmin. Plasmin is like an acid. So the moment it sees the clot or whatever it comes in its way, it just washes it out. And this fibrin clot will change into fibrin degradation products, FDPs. So remember, when you see FDPs in the blood test, you have these FDPs and D-dimers, D-dimers were done during these COVID times, they are reflecting the pathology that some clot formation occurred and this fibrinolysis using the plasmin acted upon those clot and gave rise to D-dimers and FTPs. These are the kind of, this is the fragment D, which is the D-dimers. One, one D here, one D there, then it'll become a dimer and that will indicate that some thrombotic process must have occurred. Okay, we will leave this. So what are the clotting factor deficiencies? There are many that are hereditary. They're all called the rare clotting disorders or orphan diseases. But you see the rare disorders occurring a dozen times, factor A deficiency hemophilia, A factor nine deficiency, B fundamental disease and many other. All of them put together would not remain rare. They will become common. But the top three, that is uh, hemophilia A from factor A deficiency, factor nine deficiency given guys to Christmas disease or B and fonibular disease are rare, but they are not that rare and not in MAMC because MAMC has the world's largest hemophilia center. Okay, so how do you, what clinical evaluation you do in bleeding and coagulation disorders? In general, vascular, I have told you about the difference between the mucosal superficial bleed and the deep bleeds here. Then the second aspect that you must keep in mind is whether it is hereditary or acquired. And generally the simple rule is, if you see the hereditary clotting disorders, they affect one clotting factor, like hemophilia factor eight or factor nine. Whereas the acquired clotting disorders affect more than one factor. Look at the liver disease. So you have this hepatitis, cirrhosis, portal hypertension, clotting factor affected. All the clotting factors that are produced by liver are affected. So you will see the same in DIC. You'll see the same in uh, snake bite. These are the three major uh, reasons of clotting defects which are acquired that you'll see in medical practice. And all of them will be multiple. So what screening tests you can do? You can do the, you first you make out whether it's superficial mucosal platelet vascular defect where you do a platelet count. Then you can be sure that if there is thrombocytopenia, you want to know whether it is hereditary or acquired. If the count is normal, it can be normal because it's a vascular disorder. But we also know that it can be normal if there is a functional defect. Functional defect is called thrombosthenia. So where you'll do the platelet function test like the acrogometry. So it's a simple uh, flow diagram to, to approach the platelet vascular defects. Let us see the coagulation defects. So is there a defect of coagulation? See how many sites are bleeding. Is it local or systemic or hereditary or whatever? So if systemic, which component? Clinical plus coagulation screen plus platelet that you have done for the vascular and smear and BT. These are the five tests that you do as a screening. And remember, if, oh, oh, once again, let me put my charge of the battery. So, oh, what happened? So, if you, if you, if you look at this, uh, charging. If you, if you look at the clinical bleeding, the bleeding can be small, it can be large, it can be life threatening. Remember, whenever you are managing bleeding, the first step is you must start infusion. Infusion of normal saline followed by blood because blood RBCs will take some time to come. So you must uh, start this. At the same time, when you're starting the IV line, you must take hemoglobin, and blood clot grouping, cross-matching, and because blood is eventually what may be required and life-saving there. And the rate and severity of bleeding would dictate how much that would be required. Also the comorbid conditions like 
A person who has got a poor coronaries, he needs more blood than a young man who has good coronaries. Uh, clinical bleeding assess uh, will not go out. Okay, single or multiple, multiple. Okay, this we can leave. Okay, right. So the 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 this indicates what test generally we do for screening vascular. We do a bleeding time, yeah, bleeding time, and uh, this is the template bleeding time. If we do it well, it is quite helpful. Or you can also do this HESIS test that you do in dengue also and in elderly also. Platelet count, platelet function, number three, and Fritz smear, which I've told you why. And for the clotting protein, you do three basic tests, prothrombin time, augmented partial thromboplastin time, and a thrombin time. PT, APTT are essential. Even if you are not doing TT, TT, we do more in cardiology. So PT, APTT, if they are normal and you still think there is something, you do a fibrinogen assay. If still it is there, then you do a factor 13 assay. So two are routine, PT, APTT, fibrinogen, and factor 13 are backup in case you can't find anything. And for those who are smart out of you, thrombin time and alpha-2 plasmin deficiency are the other ones. So let us take this common test that we do and what, what do we find? So you do a prothrombin time and a APTT. I said these two are done usually together. These are simple to do. If PT is high, it can be um, 2, 7, 9, 10, right? The vitamin K dependent factors. So it can be one factor defect or multiple factor defect. If it is a multiple factor defect, it would be liver disease. And you will see that most of the time PT is high either from liver disease or vitamin K antagonists, because all those factors uh, will have a problem of carboxylation. So liver disease or vitamin K antagonist, which is used as anticoagulant, like oral anticoagulant, like warfarin. So liver disease and warfarin would be common ones. And warfarin, when you use it, these are the common um, anticoagulants. The monitoring of the warfarin is done by the PT. PT is very finicky on depending on the reagent, and that is why you, on the reagent, there is a value called ISI, the standard of that particular reagent. And with that, you can calculate something called INR, normalized ratio of PT against that reagent. So PT is always clubbed as PT slash INR, and that is what you monitor PT is the test that you do. INR is the derivation that you came, come out with based on the reagent while. And PT INR is what is done as a monitoring for all warfarin or comorin anticoagulants. So if you look in this uh, diagram, the liver disease right on top and left lower vitamin K deficiency are the common ones. In pediatrics or some of the adults, myelomas, you might see fibrinogen problems that will also be there, but there you will do the TT also, which will be a What happens if APTT is high? Now, APTT can be high liver disease also, because liver is the source, it is the factory for all this. But APTT, if it is high from a single factor defect, that would be hemophilia. So it can be factor eight or factor nine. So APTT high in a child, male child, who has got a family history of male transmission, comes with repeated bleed into the joints or muscles, and you suspect it is hemophilia, then it would be either eight or nine, right? There is a simple way of also finding out whether it's PT or APTT, whether it is single factor defect or multiple factor defect. Because if it is single factor, it would be hereditary, even if there is no hereditary history. So if APTT is high, then you take the uh, plasma of that patient and mix it with an equal quantity of normal plasma, all right? Once you mix it with normal plasma, that means that mixed uh, sample is 50% normal and a 50% factor level of anyone will correct any deficiency. That means 
for this clotting test to be abnormal, you need a deficiency of more than 50%. Okay. Similarly, we also have a plasma which is deficient only in factor eight. So you can use that to see whether it is eight that is deficient or the correction is occurring. So if the correction occurs from a normal plasma, that means it could be one of the many that is there. And in a given scenario, if you're suspecting a hereditary disorder, it still would indicate the same. But then you can do the factor eight or factor nine also. So looking at this picture, if you have a high APTT, it can be acquired or hereditary. And also it can be from a factor deficiency, which will be single like in hemophilia eight or nine or multiple like in liver failure. At the same time, clotting, there is a problem because clotting factors are proteins, unlike the platelets. So these proteins sometimes develop what are called antibodies, like you know these autoimmune disorders and the acquired immune disorders. So sometimes these antibodies would start acting again. So there is a clotting protein, but it becomes non-functional because mute, uh, the, the antibodies start reacting against it. And those are called the anticoagulants or inhibitory antibodies. So you see at the lower most level, that this would occur either because of clotting factor deficiency or because of inhibiting antibodies. Okay, so what happens when there is elevated APTT? Deficiency of 2, 5, 10, 12, 11, 2, 7, 9, 10 is all liver, all these are liver. So inherited or required heparin is uh, factor 10, Lupus anticoagulant and many are common to PT also, 2790 are common to PT also. So, what happens if both are high? Let me ask you. So, you have this scenario where both PT and, sorry, some, somebody has written in the previous slide. Why would this be present with? No, no, this fibrinogenemia can alter the APTT also. So let me ask you, uh, uh, if both PT and APTT are high, what, what does it mean? It means one thing, at least one thing, that there is probably more than one factor that may be abnormal, okay? Though there are some common ones. And that is why it is likely to be mixed one and both pt and aptt high in medical uh, um, practice common three conditions that you will see with both pt and aptt high is liver hepatocellular failure the second you will see is dic which is very common in infections malignancies and in surgical traumas also and the third that you will see is snake bite okay i have not written it here maybe somewhere the fourth, of course, can be in inhibiting proteins that you see infrequently, okay? So elevated APT, APTT, we have just covered it. Snake bite is here, it was not there. And hereditary would be too rare because very often there are multiple. So evaluation, platelet count of hemostasis, platelet count, clot retraction, bleeding time, forget it. So FDP, forget it, forget it, forget it. Forget it. Hemostatic defects, we have done platelet. Oh, we have not done platelet, we have done platelets. Okay, now let's take a couple of more disorders. Uh, von Willebrand disease, okay? Overall prevalence, one in 100. That sounds quite good. That's no longer a rare disorder, no way. So we had done a study on uh, von Willebrand uh, disorder is not only difficult to pick up because it is quality conscious test, but it is also an expensive test. We have done a study here in our hemophilia on uh, the young ladies with puberty menorrhagia. Remember, they have very common uh, complication of anemia, all women, boys also. And uh, one of the reasons could be the menstrual loss, blood loss, and if it is excessive, sometimes they bleed for one week, 10 days, 15 days, 
So we had done the study of uh, in young ladies with puberty menorrhagia, and we found the commonest problem was fonovulibrant disease. Now it's important to remember that fonovulibrant disease is a treatable disease. It's a treatable disease with you have now pure fonovulibrant factor also available. But even if you don't go you give pure, you give impure, or you give some other things, they still would respond. Unlike the hemophilia, A and B, fonovulibrant disease can be seen in men and women both together. Right? There are three varieties. And uh, most of, uh, some are autosomal dominant. One is recessive, which becomes more severe, and deletion of chromosome 12 is, let's leave this. So what is the lab workup? Because quantum disease and factor eight are good friends, bosom friends, they work together. So if you have low quantum factor, the factor eight level also will be low. Sometimes they're misdiagnosed based on lab test as hemophilia also. But a specific diagnosis will come if you do the quantum factor antigen level or multiple level and the Functional assays using the stress-setting co or vector assay of the platelet acrogometry. What is the management? Management, first thing is education. The knowledge, the information that one has got a disease will help in the management automatically. Cryoprecipitate has some of the clotting factors. It also carries along with this clotting factor eight. That is the major one, a VWF, so that can be used. DDBAP desmopressin is something that uh, throws the throws the factor A out of the platelets and endothelium. So if you give this DDBAP, which is used in diabetes insipidus, then factor A comes out into circulation that also brings its partner phonolibrin factor, and that is why it is effective both in factor A deficiency and VWF deficiency. Epsilon amino caprioic acid is a antifibrinolytic. So remember, fibrinolysis was removing all the clots. If you remove that remover, then the clot would stay. So there are two antifibrinolytic agents. Both are available. One is epsilon amino caprioic acid, and second is tranexamic acid. Both can be used. And of course, uh, you have this factor eight, which we use for hemophilia. If it is impure form, means older form of factor eight, that carries with it phonolibrin factor. So we call it VWF rich, that you can use it. And the best is now you have a recombinant phonolibrin factor, very expensive, still not there in India, but it's available for many years everywhere, and that can be used for it. So good treatments are available. And the general principles, remember, they are not to be given any NSAIDs or aspirin because if they, if they knock out the platelet, that will complicate the issue. They are never to be given intramuscular injection or vaccine without remembering that they can bleed and create a hemoglobin. Okay, so the second disorder we'll take is hemophilia, which is a congenital bleeding, hereditary bleeding disorder caused by low levels of factor eight or nine. Eight is a cofactor, nine is a factor, they work in conjunction. They present the same way. When we look at uh, the, the, the community, hemophilia A and B present the same way. The only way to distinguish is by doing the factor eight or factor nine. Still, the prevalence of factor eight deficiency is 85%. So if we have 3,000 patients here, we have only four, 450 of them as factor 9 deficiency, the rest of them factor 8 deficiency. Both these hemophilias, A and B or factor 8 deficiency or factor 9 deficiency are the X-linked disorders. Okay? So the commonest is male pattern baldness, then you see this color blindness, and then you see the hemophilia disorders. It's and, 17 hours. And you'll have to remember some more. Okay. Now, for practical purposes, hemophilia is classified based on how much is the factor level, okay, activity level. 
So in case of fact, uh, hemophilia A, it will be factor 8, in B, it will be factor 9. So assuming that a normal factor is 100%, anybody who has got less than 1% activity is classified as severe. And anybody who has got more than 5%, it is classified as mild. And when you say more than 5%, it is 5 to 40%, because anything above 40% is classified as normal. So 40 to 140% would be normal. Moderate will be between 1 and 5, OK? What are the sites of bleeding? Joints, muscles, large joints usually, the knees, the elbows, the um, elbows, knees, ankles, and any other joint, retroperitoneum, swas bleed, CNS bleed, life threatening, very, very scary, GI bleed, trauma. And it can be with trauma or it can be without trauma. And once the hemarthrosis occurs, it's very painful. It can bleed again and again, damage the joint, what is called hemophilic arthropathy becomes a big, big issue. The blood, the iron and other things in the blood that remain in the joint lead to a hyperproliferative response and the joint synovium gets hypertrophied. The joints look big even when there is no blood in it. And the factor nine uh, would give rise to what is called hemophilia B or Christmas disease. They are both similar, except that the, the, the clotting factors are different. So when you have a, a disorder, it can be A or B. And as I said, this kind of a bleeding of big clotting proteins is common in liver disease, DIC, warfarin, or wherever you see. What is the treatment for ANB? Treatment is simpler. Factor replacement. So if it is uh, hemophilia A, which is factor 8, and factor 8 is pally with Von Willebrain. So all those oblique things that you were giving to treat Von Willebrain, that means cryoprecipitate, desmopressin, they would be effective in factor eight deficiency hemophilia A, but they will not be effective in hemophilia B. In fact, fresh frozen plasma is also effective in factor eight deficiencies. But there are general principles of uh, managing them. That is, you know, you the joint or a rest. You put some cold compresses, never put hot compresses. You immobilize the joint. These are the basic principles. Elevate the joint so that it does not uh, accumulate much edema. And never instill any intramuscular injections. Don't give painkillers which contain non-steroidal inflammatory agents. The painkillers that you can use are uh, paracetamol, or one can use in between the opiates and uh, non opiates like Trenix, uh, there's a Tremadol, and if the pain is more, you can go to the opiates. The specific treatment is a replacement by the respective clotting factor. So you have this clotting factor 8 or clotting factor 9 for hemophilia B. Here we are giving percent, but you forget you don't need to worry about this chart. What you need to worry about is. I say that hemophilia is a disease like diabetes mellitus. In diabetes mellitus, there is deficiency of a protein called insulin. So you keep giving them insulin so that they don't get into ketoacidosis, insulin or insulin-like uh, agents. So you give them insulin so that they don't get into ketosis. So you give what is called a regular replacement therapy of the protein. And this is a basic standard policy of any scientific practice. Same in hemophilia, that these persons must be given regular replacement therapy with factor eight or factor nine. How frequently you will give them? Like insulin, you have to give them three times in a day unless it's long acting. Thankfully, the clotting factor eight and nine are longer acting. And you can give factor eight every 12 hourly instead of six hourly of insulin. And factor nine, you can give every 24 hours. So once in a day of factor nine is good enough, twice in a day of factor eight is good enough. Like insulin, which have come as long acting insulins, we have what is called long acting factors. And these factors can be given once in several days for factor eight. And for factor nine, 
we can give it once in a couple of weeks. In fact, they're so long acting for hemophilia B factor 9 that you can give it once in 10 days or 14 days also. And we have some, unlike diabetes, we have also been able to create some mimetics which bypass factor 8 and 9, like they go and uh, just activate factor 10 and uh, there is no need for it. So these are the mimetics. And those drugs can also be very beneficial in, in um, treatment of hemophilia. And the clotting factors are given intravenous, but those mimetics can be given subcutaneous also. Okay, so after these hereditary or congenital defects, we have some acquired clotting disorders. I have been talking about liver disease. I've been talking about snake bites, and I've been talking about DIC. And in drugs, the oral anticoagulants are major, but then there are others also. Okay. So I think we will leave this. This this is uh, this we have come back to hemophilia. We do. Okay. So I have covered tried to cover the overview of the clotting disorders that we see in our practice. Okay. So it's a little uh, difficult topic. I have tried to make it simple. But if there are any questions. You please just put them across to me. This is your old uh, teaching block. You will uh, recall your anatomy head who has brought out so much of your college. Professor J.M. Call. This was session in 2000. Okay, so any questions? If there are no questions, we will stop here. Okay, let's get some feedback. Somebody write something if you can't. Why are you not? I made everybody unmute. Even then. Uh... Okay. Thank you so much. Parinit is the only one that has come out. 125 is the attendance. Very good. Okay, good. Um, then have a nice evening. Stop showing the screen. Good. Enjoy your day. Oh.